Hello and welcome to International Marxist Radio for the last time ever, but for the first time ever, also with a visual component, so you can see behind the magician's curtain, if you like. Um, it feels like we've come full circle with International Marxist Radio because this is our season finale. It's the final episode in this guise. And we've got one of our very first guests, Ben Gleneski, who's a writer and editor for Socialist.net and Socialist Appeal, which is also the name of the British section of the International Marxist Tendency. So, Ben, thank you for joining us once again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Yeah, it feels like it's been quite a long time. It feels like a lifetime ago that we it sat across the table true. and talked about the crisis of liberalism. Yeah, I, I, it's funny that you say that. I hadn't thought about that being one of the earlier episodes. And, uh, and here we are now talking about what we can do about this crisis. Uh, and has liberalism improved its standing <laughs> any more than it was doing back I don't 30 think episodes so. ago? I don't think so. I think even if you were to ask the, the strategists of capital, the, the people who stick up for liberalism uh, the most vociferously, they would say that it is still on a, in a very ropey situation. Well... Fortunately, we're not here to specifically talk about liberalism. We're here to talk about a rather different ism. Uh, we're here to talk about communism. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the podcast will be ending in its current guise, but it's not going to be disappearing by any means. Um, instead, we're going to undergo a process of change. We're going to Put an end to international Marxist radio, but uh, like a phoenix rising from the flames, we'll come back bigger and stronger than ever under a brand new name. Um, that name is going to be the Spectre of Communism. So you can look forward to that in coming months. And part of the reason we're making this change relates to a campaign that Ben, along with the rest of the British organization of the IMT, Socialist Appeal, has been running over the, the last several months. And you can see... Uh, banner behind me, which bears the name of that campaign. Are you a communist? So we'll get into why the name changed for the podcast later on. Uh, hopefully we can explain that through our discussion about the campaign that the British organization is running, the reasons behind it, the things that you've learned over the course of doing it. And I think we should start, so Marxist, when we, whenever we you know, make a decision about our propaganda or our approach to society, we always have to begin by gauging the mood and the consciousness of the masses. So, Ben, um, let's talk about the mood in society at this juncture. Yeah, I mean, look, that, that is the most important thing. And that's what got us thinking a little bit about this campaign is, is how are people feeling at the moment? Obviously in Britain, but I think it's there's a bit of an international dimension to to the mood, the, the radical mood that exists in society at the minute. I mean, look, for example, it wasn't that long ago, very recently, there were these this massive movement in France, these riots that took place over the killing by the police of this of this young uh, Arab guy. Yeah, Nahel. Yeah, Nahel. That's right. And and if that doesn't tell you something about the mood of young people. In France, then then I don't know what does, and and it's, it actually it's not just in France. Like in Britain, a couple of months ago in South Wales, it was a much smaller thing, but there were riots there as well because of two teenagers who died in a in a in a crash after a police chase, and you know it, it's a symptom of the same mood of desperation of anger that exists. Yeah, that actually happened not far from where I grew up in Cardiff in a working class area called Ely. These two kids who were hit by a bus after being chased on an electric bike by a police vehicle. And that's interesting that you say that, actually, because everybody, I think, has increasingly, this is not just something that happens in the news, everybody has some connection to the feeling of anger that exists in society. They know someone who's struggling or they know someone who's who's been involved in events like that. There was a poll recently, actually, that said 55% of people thought that the cost of living crisis was going to result in public disorder. Mm. And that's because people know of other people suffering, or they themselves are suffering, and they can't see a way out. I mean, public disorder, that suggests there's no there's no political way out, even even the strikes and so on, not delivering what people want. There's this rage that exists in society that is that is going to be popping up in, in various different ways. I mean, they're talking of polls, there was another one uh, that said that three out of five voters in Britain at the moment 
agree with the statement that nothing in Britain works anymore. And you do, you can really, you get that mood. You talk to people about the NHS or education, uh, the political system in general, everything feels like it's crumbling and and that people can't see a way forward. And that does produce a lot of radicalization, I think. I mean, think about the inequality, for example, that exists mm. in Britain now as well. There, there was a conference recently, it was at the Savoy, swanky hotel, central London, put on by some wealth that, like asset management company, or no, it was an asset management magazine or, or something like that, it had a conference. Lots of bankers, lots of rich people, the elite were there, you know. And at that, they were saying, look, there is a real, I think the, the exact quote from one of the speakers was, there is a real risk of actual insurrection. It reminds me a little bit, a few years ago, the Financial Times were talking about an impending pitchfork moment. Yeah, that's it. You know, references to peasant uprisings and working class revolutions. A section of the ruling class can feel the heat under their backsides and they understand the danger implicit in the situation. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. And you see it as well. Um, when that Titan submersible uh, submarine right. thing um, all went wrong, that, that, uh, that accident... There was so little sympathy for the people on board. And that is also a bit of an expression of class anger because these were a bunch of billionaires spending a quarter of a million dollars uh, doing, you know, some tourist thing under the sea. Or it's the same sort of thing as the billionaires just doing tourist trips to space and stuff like that. Right. And you have you have that at the same time as people not being able to afford their bills or their rent or their mortgage, or whatever it is. Well, also a comparison was made with the hundreds of desperate migrants who died just a week yeah. or two prior when that boat uh, capsized off the coast of Greece. Yeah. And lots of people were saying, in response to these you know, hypocritical moralists who were saying, oh, how dare you revel in the death of innocent people just because they were rich, it doesn't give you license mm. to laugh about their death. People were saying, well, hang on a minute. The point is, there's an incredible double standard here. Mm. On the one hand, you have, you know, this, these literal privileged few. And on the other hand, you have multitudes of desperate poor people fleeing imperialist wars, uh, who drown, um, regularly, who drown commonly. Yeah. And, um, also domestically, you've got people struggling to survive, drowning, if you like, in poverty. Mm. That's it. And it, it sums it up. Like that inequality, that is such a, a potent, fuel for for yeah outbursts of, of rioting or whatever else and and when the government clearly offers no way for the tories offer no way for they just offer more of the same more cuts whatever more pain starmer and the labor party who are looking you know riding high high in the polls at the moment there's every chance they could become the government next year um they offer exactly the same starmer's come out this week in fact saying look we're not going to spend any more money actually it's just going to yeah. be continued cuts because the only thing worse than no hope is false hope yeah. so labor is offering no hope yeah that's right and so what do people do in that situation okay they look they look a bit to the the, the unions and there's been a lot of strikes in britain over the summer those strikes are ongoing trains uh, strikes in the nhs uh, teacher strikes these are all still still like live disputes the government's come back with a revised pay offer for these uh, for the public sector, higher than what they were initially offering. Shows the power of strike action. But what that offer, uh, that increased pay offer, means they say, look, there's not actually going to be any new money being spent. So yeah, we'll fund a slightly higher pay offer, but that yeah. will come from cuts elsewhere. Yeah, Rob Peter to pay Paul, basically. Yeah, and so if these trade union leaders think that uh, this this revised pay offer is going to put an end to class struggle and to the crisis that is faced by the public sector in general. Obviously, that's not the case. And these these strikes and these disputes and the fight back that is taking place and that needs to take is only going to carry on. There's no, in other words, that like, there's no solution here. There's no way for people can feel the hitting of a dead end. And that is producing a lot of radicalization, I think, in, in society. So we've established that there's a lot of anger it feels as though there's no way out for ordinary people. But why communism specifically? Because we all hear, you know, this um, cheap analysis that socialism is scary, let alone communism. People will say, oh, look at the legacy of Stalinism. Look at the gulags. Look at the Cold War. Look at the reds under the bed. You're going to completely alienate people if you start talking about communism. But the experience that the British comrades of Socialist Appeal have had with their new campaign, which I'd like you to talk about a little bit, explain exactly what this campaign is, 
and the logic behind it. But the experience that you've had, certainly and notably amongst young people, has been rather different. Yeah, that that is exactly right. All this anger that exists in society, that's been around for a while. It's ever increasing, but that's been there for, for quite a long time. We've been aware of that. And obviously, we're all about you know, we are Marxists, we're socialists, we're communists, and we want to change the world. So we want to, we've been wanting to connect with that mood for a long time. And, and then in, uh, in about March, this poll came out, uh, some poll by some right-wing uh, yeah. think tank. The Fraser Institute, I the think. The Fraser Institute, that's it. Uh, which said, among other things, that 29% of people aged 18 to 34 in Britain thought that communism was the best economic system. Now, I know it's one poll and uh, you know, whatever, it's, that's what it is. But I, I saw that and, and, well, we all saw that in the British, uh, in the, in British organisation and thought, We've, this, is, this is quite significant. We, we should really be trying to connect with, with people here on that level. And so we launched this campaign. Are you a communist? Very bold, very open. Are you a communist? Apparently, I mean, that number, 18, 29% of 18 to 34-year-olds, that's about 4.5 million people mm. in the UK. So if there's 4.5 million people walking about saying, yeah, communism's a really good idea, we thought, well, we've got to, we've got to connect a bit with that. So we launched this, this open campaign, very bold. Are you a communist? Uh, then get organized. So what did it involve, this campaign? I mean, look, the main thing is uh, on social media uh, and in our, in our publications, in our newspapers, obviously on the website, and also like posters and stickers, sending them to our supporters uh, so they can display and like, advertise the campaign. Just getting the, getting it out there as much as possible. Honestly, that's the main thing. It's just visibility. It's mm. just, because the, the people are there. That's the point. We don't. Twenty nine percent of people said that they they were interested in this stuff. So all we have we don't have to convince people of it already. All we have to do is is run our flag up the flagpole and say, hey, look, the communists are over here. Right. So anything that could be done to raise visibility, just chatting to your mates at work. Talking to your friends at school. I'm a communist. Are you a communist? You making know. making a podcast all about it. Making a podcast about it. Anything that you, that can be done uh, to raise visibility, and you but you've got to be bold with it. You've got to be very open, very bold. Talk to everyone about it, and uh, and it is it is landing. You know, like we've we've got hundreds and hundreds of people contacting us on the back of this. Far more than we've ever had at any other time off off the back of this campaign. How many are we talking? Uh, I think right in like uh, online applications to join, which is not our only source of of people that we're finding, but online applications to join in the last however long we've been running this since about April, uh, have uh, we're now over fifteen hundred. That's really remarkable. Yeah, it's, it is incredible when you when you think about it for the for the size that we are, for the kind of organisation that we are. But I think I think people are are looking towards communism specifically. Like they want a radical change. We've established that, but they look towards communism because they don't see. Not only do they not see a way out on the basis of um, the Tories, obviously, or Starmer and the Labour Party, but they didn't even see. You know, we had we had Corbyn, for example, in Britain, and nothing came of it. He was attacked by the right wing. He was attacked by the press. He was, you know, vilified and all the rest of it. He never even made it into into power. But he offered this way forward. He said, "Look, we, we don't have to fundamentally change the system. We can just make capitalism a bit nicer." And he was absolutely battered by the capitalist class, right. by the establishment, by his own party. By his own party. Or by the MPs within his own party, I should say. Yeah. And so a certain layer of, of people have drawn a conclusion from that, which is, well, you can't you can't reform the system. You can't come at it from the inside mm. and and just make it a little bit nicer. You had the same thing with Bernie Sanders, actually, in, in the US, for example. Go back a bit further, you had the same thing in Greece with uh, Alexis Tsipras and the Syriza government, who had the same approach, a kind of left-wing Make the, make capitalism a bit better, basically. Just ask the rich to pay a bit more tax and so on, and it's it's repeatedly failed. And then on the mm. other side, you've had Brexit, uh, Boris Johnson, Trump, right wing populism, basically xenophobia, blaming all the problems that people face on immigrants or Muslims or whatever else, and saying if we just solve those problems, if we just take a right wing approach, basically, then we'll solve all the problems and everything will get better. And it's been tried, and that also has not worked. Right. And people are drawing conclusions from that. They're looking for something different. And they're looking, actually, not, not loads of people. And we're not talking about, well, actually, we kind of are talking about millions, given that poll. But uh, we're not maybe not talking about the majority of British society. But lots and lots of people have gone through those experiences the last few years and thought, we need, we need a more fundamental change. And communism offers that, obviously. You know, it's funny. When you mentioned the Sanders movement, it put me in mind of a chat I had with one of our American comrades from Socialist Revolution the American section of the international Marxist tendency. And they said that in the aftermath 
of the Sanders movements. So after its second defeat, I think, when once again he, Sanders failed to be appointed the you know candidate for the Democratic um, Party in the election, we had a write-in from a young guy. And he said, I agree with everything you guys say on your website. I think it's fantastic. We need a revolution in the USA. The trouble is you call yourselves socialists and I'm a communist. Yeah. And what that expresses, obviously, in, in you know, a slightly naive way, is socialism in the minds of a significant layer of population, especially young people. It's associated with the failure of reformists like Jeremy Corbyn, reformists like Sanders, like Chepras, like Podemos, to even, in, in most cases, even get as far as power. Mm. But in the case of Syriza, for example, getting as far as power and then betraying. Mm. Obviously, you know, our understanding is different. We're, we're, we're socialists and also communists. However, I think that what it speaks to is that a lot of people are rejecting reformism. They're rejecting, you know, meat and potatoes, social democracy, uh, incremental change within the system, taxing the rich, a bit more spending here and there. What they want is a fundamental and profound break with the old order and communism speaks to them. Yeah. And they're rejecting it because it's been proven not to work. That's right. the point. And uh, and that will increasingly be the case. Look, reformists and reformism is not it's not dead and gotten. There's uh, and that that will still be around. But obviously, what people are realizing is that if you want those kind of reforms, if you want those changes, everything that Corbyn was saying, more money for the NHS, for education, more house building, all of that. Yeah, communists fight for that as well. But if you want those things, it has to be. It can only be won in this period of of crisis of attacks on the working class. It can only be won through a revolutionary struggle of the mm -hmm. working class, not just trying to get along with the capitalists and just try and convince the capitalist class, basically, that they can just be a bit nicer. So pe people have drawn that conclusion. And yeah, they're looking for something a bit more a bit more radical. And they, and they land on communism, which, as you said at the, be uh, at the beginning of this, this part, when we start talking about communism, you said, well, people are, you know, historically a little bit scared when they hear communism. I, I remember when I was first getting politically active, you couldn't talk about communism because it conjured up images of Stalin and this kind of thing. And that obviously is a lot of the education that we receive at school is, is very heavily weighted against, very anti-communist, a lot of the stuff that, yeah, that we get There's a lot taught. of bourgeois propaganda that's leveled against communism. Yeah. But interestingly, I actually think that how hard that is pushed in schools, for example, and by the establishment generally in all spheres, actually gets people more interested in it now because the establishment is so hated. Do you remember a couple of years ago where I think it, I think it was under the Trump presidency, the US government put out a huge document which was aimed at young people basically saying why socialism and Marxism are wrong. Yeah. It's like, hey kids, so you think communism is cool? Well, actually, and it was pages and pages and pages of the normal, the usual rubbish, of course. But uh, absolutely, I think that it's evidence, and it comes across in the Fraser Institute poll as well, that at least a good section of the ruling class is terrified of the specter of communism, you know, casting a shadow over the young in particular, because of the way that the system has failed them. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and the more they panic about it, the more they worry about it, the more they write their articles and their books saying this this would be a really bad this is a really bad thing this has been a bad thing in the past because it is them who are saying it and they are so hated mm. by young people especially and increasingly by by even older workers and stuff like this. Um, People are, are actually more interested in it. The, the bad guy says, "Oh, don't don't pay attention to these ideas." You think, "Well, I'm definitely going to pay attention to mm -hmm, those ideas." Mm -hmm. And and you know, the bogeymen of, of of Stalinism and the USSR. I think people are are instinctively aware that 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 Stalinism is not what communism looks like. China today, despite being ruled by the communists, is not what communism looks like. Despite look, there are groups around, there are Stalinists today around who will say. Oh yeah, no, the Stalin was great, the USSR was great, or China today, yeah, that is genuine communism. But these are these are very small groups with very little influence. And I think most people can see that that's a bit of a silly thing to say. Mm. They, they understand that uh, that was not... Although there were major successes and major achievements of, in the USSR and and the, the Chinese Revolution in 1949, major achievements, yeah, but that's not what, what communism actually looks like. And people mm. understand that there is something different to capitalism. That, that's that's genuine communism. They might not be able to define it very clearly, but they want to they want to find out more about it and fight for it. And we'll talk a bit more about what it means in 
2023 to be a communist later on, but just about the reaction to this campaign. Uh, I, I've been around um, the UK in the last few weeks, and it seems I can't walk more than about 100 yards without seeing one of, well, a poster version of this banner. Um, fantastic design, by the way. Kudos to the British comrades on their design work. It's really striking uh, and very bold. Um, you know, I, I really think that part of what makes the campaign so effective is the way that it unapologetically claims communism and poses the question. But you, you have all these posters and stickers that have been put up all across the country. And there's QR codes where you can scan them. And if you see one, if you're watching this in Britain um, and you're put in touch with your nearest group, uh, put in touch with the British organization and can get involved. Um, but what I've been told is that in addition to scanning the QR code, lots of people have written messages in response to this question, are you a communist? And some of them are very, very bold and very, very striking. Um, do you have any examples of the kinds of responses, the kinds of messages we're getting off the back of the campaign? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, look, when, when people get in touch and they apply to join, they can fill out this form. And one of the uh, one of the questions is, is why do you want to join? And yeah, it is, it is amazing to see what, what some people are writing in. I mean, a lot of it is... I've got a few here. I mean, a lot of it is things like, I'm sick and tired of how the country's run. I want to stand up for myself. Capitalism is failing. It's ruining the lives of everyone who isn't rich. There's there's a lot of general, uh, quite militant anti-capitalist sentiment. And then you've got some more specific ones. There's this one, which uh, which I enjoyed. I think my school would benefit massively from a communist group. Our head teacher is a Tory. I'll be making my own posters for a communist group at my school, but I'd love some more information. So you're getting that kind of attitude, that mood from um, yeah from school and college students, and then you have from a this is this one came in from a teacher on the other side, but it's still within schools. I want to see my students live happy and healthy lives without the worries and struggles that come with living in this broken system, which is why I want to join a communist organisation. You've got worries. We've had a lot of people writing in with worries about climate change. Also, that comes up a lot. Capitalism has us heading for the end of the world, one person says. It's time to try something new. Another one. I'm young, but I can see the devastating effect of capitalism on the globe. I want to contribute to revolutionary change. I want to help make life better for my generation and generations to come. So that is that is also climate change. And all that is, is playing very uh, much on a lot of people's minds. And then there's this one. It's quite It was quite a long message, but... I think it really sums up the mood that we were talking about earlier. Uh, this person says, I'm 24, and the entirety of my life that I've been aware of politics has been spent under what feels like a Tory dictatorship. Everything keeps getting worse. People I love require medical assistance, but they've been on waiting lists for over 18 months. I used to love swimming in the River Saw, but now it's polluted with sewage. I've had enough of living like this. I'm desperate for a solution. Britain is no longer great, but it has so much potential. It infuriates me to see that potential being bled dry by the haves, while the have-nots toil away for no reward. I believe socialism is the solution. And I think that is the perfect... We've had hundreds and hundreds of these messages, and that last one there really encapsulates what, what most of them are saying. I mean, very, very powerful and very radical. I mean, it goes to show... I think sometimes even we as revolutionaries can underestimate just how advanced the consciousness of just ordinary people, ordinary workers, ordinary students, ordinary young people ha um, has become. And as you say, it's, it's precisely because of the impasse of capitalism and the just naked cruelty and naked inequality that's foisted upon humanity and also a fear of the future. I mean, that comes across mm. very strongly as well, yeah, a sense right. of will we even have a future? Will, will my children, will the next generation have a world or have a civilization to inherit if the world continues uh, in this direction, if capitalism continues to inflict the damage that it is? So I think that's something I'd like to clarify, because we talked a little bit about um, you know, reclaiming communism and attitudes towards communism. But first of all, how do we present communism what's the tradition that we inherit mm. when we talk about communism what do we really mean and in what sort of lineage do we stand yeah yeah now this is an important question 
because there are lots of, of people, individuals, groups, organizations, parties that lay claim to the heritage of communism. And and we should be really clear. Like we, I, I would describe myself, Socialist Appeal, the IMT, as an orthodox Marxist organization. Uh, and by that I mean we 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 read, we study the ideas, and we stand in the tradition of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky. Uh, that is the tradition of the first international, where Marx and Engels really began to establish Marxist ideas. They fought against anarchist tendencies, for example, and ultra-left tendencies of that kind. They fought against the opportunism of the English uh, labor movement leaders who were not really willing to fight capitalism. They were generally left-wing and wanted to fight for the work class, but they were not willing to go all the way and fight capitalism. Marx and Engels in that period really established what it, what it is to be a Marxist. And then you had Lenin and Trotsky building... Uh, the third international, Engels obviously you they had the second international which Engels was involved with these were mass parties, mass workers parties connecting those ideas that had been established early on by Marx and Engels with the labour movement in general as a whole, Marx's daughter Eleanor Marx was also heavily involved with that uh, and that, that took enormous steps forward. Lenin and Trotsky then established the third international, the communist international, which fought a really uh, sharp struggle against reformism and that was it was born on in on in the fires of that struggle against reformism mm -hmm. in, the, in the fires of the first world war actually yeah at which point the so-called leaders of the labor movement around the world uh voted for war credits and sent their respective working classes to butcher each other in the trenches yeah that's right so this this these mass so-called marxist parties the second international deviated quite far from their roots their all their 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 alleged ideology and yet yeah, supported an imperialist war. And Lenin and Trotsky weren't, ha weren't having it. So they established a new international, the third international, the communist international, the Comintern, as it was known. And yeah, that, as I say, that that really struggled against, um, on the one hand, opportunism and the, the, the bending to the pressures of imperialism and capitalism that had taken place in the second international. They also had to fight a big battle in that third international, though, also against ultra-leftism mm. and, uh, and, and against very wrong-headed tactics that were being pursued in, in one country after another, actually, by the communist parties at that time. Um, but then, of course, Lenin died, and what you had then was a struggle inside the Soviet Union and also in the Communist International between uh, Stalinism, which actually was repeating a lot of the mistakes that had been made, uh, going all the way back even to the First International, of some of the opportunism, some of the ultra-leftism, and so on. So there, was, there were lots of uh, very bad mistakes being made by Stalin and being pursued by Stalin. Trotsky was fighting a battle against those, and he was trying to keep the international along those Leninist lines. Um, now, Trotsky lost that uh, battle because of the general balance of class forces inside the Soviet Union at the time, the encirclement of the Soviet Union, the exhaustion that came from uh, from, from the civil war and everything else, and, and, and the bureaucracy that arose in Russia as a result was sufficiently powerful that it was able to, to destroy Trotsky's followers, and obviously, ultimately... Um, kill Trotsky himself. What it wasn't able to do was get rid of his ideas, and that idea of Trotskyism is is that battle against Stalinism. It's the battle for international socialist revolution, as opposed to socialism socialism in one country and everything else. And and ever since then, uh, there have been many groups that have called them and many organisations that call themselves Trotskyist, and all of them have gone off in peculiar, or many of them, all of them, except really, I would say. Uh, the organization that has now become the IMT, have gone off in peculiar directions, uh, theoretically, philosophically, in terms of their tactics and everything else. I would say that there is a bit of an unbroken thread in terms of the ideas that we defend that goes through Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, to, to the, the international Marxist tendency today. So that's the tradition that we stand in. And it's not a small pedantic point. Our ideas are the bedrock of our organization. We don't Otherwise, we're just some other generally vague left-wing organization. We, we, we don't really have a right to exist other than to defend those ideas. So it's important that we understand what those ideas are uh, and, then, and then work to make them relevant and, and implement them and, and connect them with the working class and the labor movement today. And what does that mean to connect them to the situation today? Um, I think you've outline well where we come from but where are we going and what do we say to people who are fighting the bosses to this new layer of 
workers on the picket lines to young people who are becoming radicalized what do we say it means to be a communist in this day and age mm. yeah look i mean that's important and the, and the starting point because this is what it's all about at the end of the day we don't just we don't just say that we're communists or marxists or whatever because we like the identity or the aesthetic of the whole thing um all <clears throat> that is great as i said yeah the aesthetics <laughs> are good but uh, even if the aesthetics were poor, it's the ideas that are the most important thing. And so like, what I say to people, uh, the starting point, as far as I'm concerned, is if you want to fight capitalism, if you want to overthrow capitalism, if you want to change the world, then you belong in this organization. Um, <clears throat> so that is the starting point. We're not, we're not about reforming capitalism. We're not some small reformist organization. We're not some charity organization. We're going to change the world. That's the, but if, and if you want to be a part of that, great. But obviously, as an individual, there's not very much you can do. So if you want to change the world, if you are a communist, then, as it says, you have to get organized. You have to join something. You have to get stuck in. That's the first thing. I, I, I don't have that much time for people who, who say that they're communists, who sort of spout off about communism, as I say, who wrap themselves in the aesthetic, but who are unwilling to put their money where their mouth is, put their time where their mouth is, and actually do something to fight for it. No, it's important to get organized. You say you're a communist, you've got to get organized. Um, <clears throat> now, that means, first of all, it does mean getting educated about what we're doing. That's the first task of a communist in 2023. First of all, it's to know your enemy. We're fighting capitalism. Well, what is capitalism and how does it function? That's what, I mean, you think about it. That was what Marx put a lot of time. He wrote three volumes on capitalism. He didn't write three volumes saying, what will socialism look like mm. and painting this wonderful picture of the future. He wrote three volumes on how does capitalism function? Because it, you need to understand that. You need to understand how capitalism functions. You need to understand the capitalist class and how they work. You need to understand the state, which is a weapon of the capitalist class, and how that functions and how it's all tied together. You've got to know your enemy, understand what's going on. That knowledge doesn't just appear out of nowhere. You have to study that a little bit and think about it and discuss it with people. That's the first thing. Because we also have to, we have to combat those pressures. We have to, com we have to fight against, we have to fight against, yeah, the pressures of, the economic pressures of capitalism, also the ideological pressures of capitalism. They have factories of peculiar uh, ideas in the form of universities and think tanks and things like this, which pump out all sorts of weird and wonderful philosophical and sociological ideas, which are designed basically not to clarify people's understanding of the world, but just to, to raise more questions than they answer, to confuse people, and ultimately to make them feel, well, we're all a bit powerless, aren't we? Like, actually, there is no real way to understand the world. There are no overarching theories or, uh, or, or means of, of changing anything. Actually, we're all just our own individuals with our own interpretations of things. And, and that's just what the world is, just a mess of individuals. That's not the case. But this is, this is the kind of stuff that gets pumped out. So being able to combat, being able to understand the capitalist system, combat its ideological pressures, that is the first task of a communist. And also, like we're not the first people to try this. We're not the first people ever to, to try to build a revolutionary communist organization. There have been many attempts in the past. Some successful, like the Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks and the Russian Revolution in 1917, and many, many failed ones. Well, we have to study all of those. We have to study our own history, work out what worked, what didn't work. If, if, if we say we're communists, we want to change the world, but we don't study the history of the revolutionary movement, we, we sh we're not, we, no one, we don't have the right to expect people to take us seriously. Mm. So, so educating yourself, studying, this is the, this is the first task of a, of a communist, uh, I would say, in, in 2023. Um, <clears throat> And that's, by the way, that is really what a major task of our branches, of the branches of the IMT, not just in Britain, but around the world, is to meet up on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, and have a, have a bit of a political discussion mm. and educate ourselves. So that's the first thing I say. If you're interested in, in revolutionary ideas, in changing the world, in finding out how to do that, what, how capitalism works, how the class struggle works, then... You've got to get involved and join and discuss. You'll learn a lot more through discussion, through collective education, than you will just sitting on your own. But obviously, it's about more than that. That's half of it. That's that, or that's the starting point. But these ideas, all this understanding, this knowledge is not that much good. I'm saying we can have that knowledge and we can sit there feeling very smug because we know lots, but that is not enough on its own. Mm. Our job is to connect that to the class struggle uh, and and to the, to the movement. Now, first thing you've got to do for that, as an individual, there's a limited amount you can do. 
So the first thing is to find other people who are interested. As we've just talked about, there are millions of people out there who are interested in these kind of ideas. I promise you, in it, whatever, wherever you are, in your school, in your university, in your workplace, in your neighbourhood, I promise you there are some, there are communists there. Didn't there are... we meet someone recently who works on a deep sea oil rig? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you find, you find, find uh, comrades in the North Sea. Um, <clears throat> you can find them anywhere. You know, people, people are, are looking for radical ideas. As I said earlier, all you need to do is run the flag up the pole and see who responds. So that's the first thing. Get to know the ideas that you're, that you're talking about and start to find other people who are also interested. Even if you don't know the idea, no, no one, no one is born a Marxist. No one's born having a good knowledge of the history of the class struggle and, and the understanding of Marxist economics. If you can, if you're interested in finding that out, I bet you there are other people who you're probably already in touch with who are also interested in finding out a bit more about this kind of stuff. You've got to find a way to reach them, whether that's on social media or selling newspapers, selling social to people newspapers or, or, or whatever it is. Talk to people in your workplace. Talk to people at your college or university. I promise those people are there. But you've got to go at it with a lot of enthusiasm. You've got to be bold with it. Find a, a group of people who, like you, are interested in, in changing the world and studying the ideas that are required to do that. That's the first thing is find those people and start discussing politics with them. And as you do that, you begin to, and as you get a bigger, bigger and bigger group of people, you begin to realize, look, we can actually connect these ideas with, uh, with, with other people, with broader layers, actually. And especially at the moment where there's lots of strikes going on, there's people on picket lines fighting the class struggle, fighting the bosses. Those are the kind of people who we can connect our ideas with. And so we need to get along to those picket lines and support those strikes and support those workers and discuss not just the specifics of that strike with them, although that is important, um, and and in many cases, it might be people. It might be it might be you. It might be your us. You know, our own comrades who are on strike, for example. We'll talk with your colleagues who are on strike, not just about the specifics of that dispute, but raise the sights a little bit and say, look, this is actually part of a broader a, a broader class struggle that's going on, and connect our ideas in that way. Picket lines, demonstrations, inside trade unions. Many of our comrades are members of trade unions passing resolutions, going to national conferences, local conferences, trade unions, arguing for Marxist communist motions, communist ideas about strategy and tactics as well as the bigger questions, you know. Go to, go to your local neighbourhood and have a look, set, up a, set up a communist recruitment store and, uh, and sell newspapers and other, other literature. You will find people, you know, you'll connect with people. And, and you can do that on your own or you can do it just two of you in a, in a town or a city or whatever else. Yeah, get creative, guys. Yeah, exactly. You, like, there's no need to be shy in this. People are looking for these ideas. That's the point. So that's the, that's the essence of, of what we need to be doing at the moment, I think, is yeah, getting to grips with, with what it is that we're saying to people, what it is that we're studying, what the ideas actually are, and then go out and, and, and find other people who want to discover this stuff with you. And uh, and connect it to a broader movement. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there has never been a better time to be a communist. Yeah, that's I, definitely true. I think that the appetite for these ideas has never been greater. But that also means that there's a certain responsibility mm. that you know is incumbent upon anybody who considers themselves a communist, a, a revolutionary. We need to get out there and we need to spread the ideas and we need to build because what's the lesson of the failed revolutions that you've mentioned? Obviously, they all have their peculiarities. There are many different reasons that revolutions have been defeated. But I would say that the one overarching issue has been the absence of a Bolshevik party, mm. the absence of revolutionary leadership to give direction um, to the struggles of the working class that can and will erupt on their own in response to the dire circumstances facing ordinary people the point is without a leadership built in advance and you see it time and time again you saw it with the arab revolution in 2011 you saw it in the sudanese revolution in like in 2018 2019 uh, all, all throughout history in fact the absence of a revolutionary party is um, the the main cause for the defeat of revolutionary struggles. So we need to start the process of building that instrument for the working class to be able to fight, win, and take power. Yeah, that that is right. And when you when you think of it like that, what we're talking about, because I guarantee, in certainly in Britain and in 
I would say probably every other country, most other countries. Within our lifetimes, there will be, and it's, it's not that far away, 5, 10, 15 years, in some countries it's already happening or happened, there will be movements, there'll be mass movements of, of the working class that have the ability, have the potential to completely change society, to, over, to, yeah, to overthrow capitalism. Right. That potential is going to be there and it's coming in our lifetimes. What are we going to do about that? We, if we, if we, if not everyone listening to this perhaps agrees with that. That's okay. I'm not, at this stage, I'm not trying to win over 4.5 million people, however many people there are interested in communism. But there will be a lot of people listening to this who do agree with that, who can see that, who can see the change that is coming, who see the anger in society, the movements that is going to spark, and the potential of those movements to change. Well, what are you? The question is, what are you going to do about that? Mm. Are you just going to sit there on the sidelines and and watch it come like this massive way? Watch it come and then watch it roll past and and just hope for the best? Or are you actually going to do something to try and harness that potential? That's what we're trying to do here. And we harness that potential by connecting to that movement with ideas that say, look, it's not just this or that problem. It's not just a question of wages or, or greedy bankers or, or rotten Tories or whatever it is. It's actually a, a more fundamental question of the capitalist system. And there is a way to overthrow that and establish something different, a socialist society, a communist society. What might that look like? How might that function? And what tasks do we have to do now? All those lessons exist from, from past struggles, from past examples. Our job is to get ourselves educated in that and connect it to those movements that are coming. That's what you can do today. So don't just sit on the sidelines, get stuck in. Yeah, it's an investment. It's an investment of time and it's an investment of money. This Nothing is free under capitalism. And it, it, take, yeah, it, takes, it takes contributions from people who support, from people like, like you who are listening, who support these ideas. Yeah, it takes it takes financial contributions as well as a contribution of time. But what what else are you going to be spending yet? As this massive wave of class struggle is coming towards us with the potential to completely change Britain and the entire world, what else are you going to be spending your, your time and money on? Like mm-hmm. down the pub or whatever else, just frittering it away on all the things that, that the capitalists want us to fritter away on. Mm. No, this is a this this is what you should be spending your time and money on. Think about all the stuff that we that we waste our time and money on. This is a serious uh, yeah. and valuable business, and that and that's the point. Like we are not messing about here. As I said mm. before, this is not some. This is not for the aesthetic. This is not for a laugh. It's not for academic reasons. We are going to change the world, and the opportunity is going to come about within our lifetimes. Don't let it pass you by. Right, and we are asking for an investment. Our business is revolution as communists. And what you're investing in when you contribute your time and your money to helping the IMT build in any country in the world is in a decent and dignified existence for humanity. And there can be no uh, sounder investment than that and no greater cause. Well, I think this has been an absolutely superb note to end the International Marxist Radio podcast series on. Um, thank you so much, Ben, for being here to help us give the show such a great send off. And if you are one of those people that Ben was referring to who are drawing revolutionary conclusions, perhaps you've been persuaded by things you've heard on the podcast in this episode or others, or through reading our material, or even on the basis of your own experiences, just reading the news and looking at the state of capitalist society and the shower in charge of capitalist society, then get in touch. I should have said that the Are You a Communist campaign is not limited to Britain. It's going global. I've seen very similar posters, suspiciously similar posters, I might say, in uh, Sweden, the Spanish states, and elsewhere. So if you see one of these or something like this, then scan the code, get in touch, or just write in directly. Uh, contact details are available via uh, all of the sites connected to marxist.com, which is our main international page. There's a lot of work to do, but we have to start somewhere. And if you take anything away from anything we've said, any of our guests have said on International Marxist Radio, is that there is a better future to be won. We stand on the shoulders of giants and we are fighting for for freedom, for humanity to be truly free. And it's only on the basis of a struggle for socialism, for communism, that we can win freedom. And all of us have a role to play. So for the very last time, I've been Joe Attard. This has been International Marxist Radio. Thank you so much again, Ben, for joining us. And we won't be gone for too long, rest assured. The um, IMR podcast might be ending, but the spectre of communism will be uh, coming to you in not too long so keep an eye on your preferred 
um, platform for podcasts. And if you're listening to this on one of your preferred um, podcast platforms, then I'll put a link in the description to where you can watch the episode online. So you can see Ben and I discussing um, the, the question of how to build communism in our lifetimes. All right. I think that's about it. Good stuff. Cheers, Jake. Thanks, Ben. <laughs>